Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist DT from weatherrisk.com, the commander of chaos, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe. It's a 1 p.m. here in the east. Uh, it's a 10 a.m. on the west coast time. Let's talk about weather. And in this particular issue, we'll have lots to talk about, uh, some new model data, some new information on some websites, which you may not be aware of. We'll talk about the next three weeks, some more, winter, some more uh, winter signals coming up here, the current snow data and build up in Siberia, and how to track the SAI or the Snow Advance Index in Siberia, generally without doing the math, and have an idea of when it's developing and whether it's developing ahead of schedule or weaker than normal or what have you. So let's get right to it. The first thing I want to talk about is tropical tidbits that li developed by the great meteorologist Levi Cohen. And uh, Levi, ha Levi has now installed the European, which I wanted to point out to you here in case you didn't see it, uh, the European global model here and the European ensembles here. <coughs> Excuse me. That is um, uh, a very nice development here. And if you go to the different sites, you can see it here. This is European. Now, this is the... Uh, f f Point five. This is the regular resolution. Okay, so the folks at Weatherbell, of course, um, you know they have the high resolution over there. You know, Weatherbell has uh, the um, zero point two five high resolution stuff, super high resolution of the European. So this does not use that, but it's still a very good, and it comes out in a fairly timely fashion. It does not have any precipitation on, if you noticed. So that's also interesting, but uh, it do, it's that's. You know, it, it's pretty good shot here. Now, this is the European, uh, the ensemble, as you can see, from yesterday, October 10th. And that uh, was a very nice looking map, very easy to read, lots of clean graphics. Uh, you know, the colors are faded in the background. They don't overwhelm the map, which is very nice. And then this is the European uh, regular, uh, again, at day 10, you can see. It has a, a tropical system there off the coast of Florida, the ridge on the, over the Rockies, some trophy over, trophiness over the Great Lakes, the Midwest, the Northeast. Big system in the Gulf of Alaska. But as you can see, and also here is your 850 temperatures. It does have that 850 temperature anomalies. So that's also very nice to see. So just want to let you know that uh, Tropical Tidbits now has the European model. And it has it for the U.S., it has it for Europe, it has it for the Northern Hemisphere, just for North America. It's a great model site and lots of information there. And it's absolutely free. All right, let's talk about the next two weeks here. Now, this is our 200 millibar velocities. And again, we've talked about this map before. When you're getting the brown stuff, uh, that means you're getting sinking air. So this is all sinking air. So the atmosphere the, is sinking. And as a result, you do not get a lot of precipitation and storminess. And the, this is rising air here in the green stuff. All the green stuff is rising air. Now, for most of this hurricane season, the brown stuff has been in the Atlantic Ocean. But recently, we begin to see a change here. And the green stuff has been to move into the Atlantic Ocean here as we close out the end of the hurricane season, move into October, November. And that's causing a bit of a surge in the hurricane activity. And if we look beyond this, Here's China, and we can see, and again, if we take a look, notice how dry it is in China here. And over the last 14 days in China and India, there's a lot of below normal rainfall because of the sinking air and the lack of precipitation over to the southeastern half of China. And now this is 180 hours out, almost a little more than a week. And again, we can see a lot of sinking air here in the western Pacific. This would mean that the hurricane activity is going to drop here uh, in the western Pacific. But look at this big, bright green surge building in across the uh, Central America into the Caribbean Basin to the Western Atlantic Ocean. That would indicate, and also South America for that matter, indicate increasing tropical activity there and potential for significant development. And in fact, if we go out to 300 hours out, we can see the dark green area has now moved into the Caribbean Basin and much of the Western and Southwestern Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, look at the brown stuff. stuff. It's still over the Philippines and Western Asia and Western Pacific, which would indicate sinking air and, and a suppression of a tropical activity here. So things may be changing. Sure enough, this is the subtropical system, depression number seven, which developed yesterday. And now this is Faye moving in, uh, as you can see, ahead towards Bermuda. It's a tropical storm there. And of course, this was, uh, I guess this is uh, a Von Fong, which is the strongest typhoon since the system last year, high in last year. And of course, at one point, it was a Category 5 headed for Japan. And this was several days ago. Now this is the current system. As you can see, it's weakened quite a bit. A uh, much more weak system, now down to 75 knots. It, is look, it does look like it's going to hit Japan, but it's a much weaker system. And then move to the northern Pacific and begin to re-energize the pattern in the northern Pacific. And as you know, 
generally or may not know when you start getting these typhoons that recurve in northern Pacific you end up getting some sort of trough in the eastern United States about 10 days later. Now this was the Arctic Oscillation and as you can see this is the lowest Arctic Oscillation any day in October since 1950. This was October 8th it dropped down to a value of minus 4.057. So uh, you know, if it stays that way for all of October in negative, that might be an indication that the Arctic Oscillation is going to run generally negative in October in the in in the should say in the in the winter months. But we don't know that. And again, just to refresh the course here, uh, a negative Arctic Oscillation is being generally cold in the normal winters and potential for significant winter storms. Now, this is the current upper atmosphere map, and I've highlighted some features here so you can see it. Uh, notice this here. We, this is our negative Arctic Oscillation here. The NAO is neutral, uh, and the but look at the Eastern Pacific Oscillation. We have a big, um, as you can see right here, Alaskan low. So the Eastern Pacific Oscillation is positive. There's no PNA at all, and the Western Pacific is positive. So the only thing going for us right now is the negative Arctic Oscillation. But it's October. It doesn't have to be anything special. Now, as we look uh, 72 hours out, we can see huge low in the Gulf of Alaska, and that's going to begin to weaken the water temperatures in the Gulf of Alaska a little bit. We have that big low over the Mississippi Valley, and again, we have a big, strong negative Arctic Oscillation. We don't have a negative NEO at all, so it's just the negative Arctic Oscillation. And if we look at our tracks, you notice, again, we can see, now this here is your Arctic Oscillation. Okay, uh, you can see it. There's the AO, and this is the NAO. Notice the NAO is slightly negative to neutral. The Arctic Oscillation drops down and it comes back up here. So again, you can have a period where your Arctic Oscillation is negative and the NAO is neutral. That's common. It's not that unusual. So, uh, especially in the autumn months. And this is the European here for 96 hours out. Again, this is from the Tropical Tidbit site. And notice here we can see some very nice uh, negative uh, Arctic Oscillation uh, above normal heights here. Big huge uh, storm here in a la a little south of uh, Greenland, so that's a positive NAO as you can see here. And then of course here's our big trough here in the Midwest, and there's a big system in the Gulf of Alaska. <clears throat> so that's the pattern here, 96 hours out, and that system's going to be a significant weather maker. And you can see the big system here centered over Missouri, and we draw our fronts in. If you were to draw our fronts in, we would draw it like this. And here's the high, and it's bringing in lots of moisture from the Gulf and the Southwest Atlantic Ocean. So this is the potential for a significant weather event, and as a result, CPC for day three has a significant severe weather outlook for the Delta and into the portions of the Mississippi Valley. And that continues, you can see October 11th, the system is still there. October 12th, the system is still there. Excuse me, this is... Uh, October 15th, October 16th, the system is still there. Very slow moving system. Over the next five days, you can see through the morning of October 16th, a lot of rain here for the Midwest and the Delta states and so on and so forth. So pretty impressive system. As we go to day nine, uh, day 10, uh, the European, this is the European uh, over here, as you can see it. And uh, this is the uh, GFS, and here's the Canadian. Notice the Canadian has a positive Arctic Oscillation, a neutral NAO, and a positive East Pacific Oscillation. In fact, look where the Aleutian Low is. Aleutian Low is here in the Gulf of Alaska. Notice it's here, and it's here on the European and the GFS. So the Canadian has a much warmer pattern, uh, no uh, supply of cold air. The European and the GFS does. So I'm going to discount the Canadian for the time being, but... Um, I uh, just wanted to show you why I was doing that. So um, there you go. I think the Canadian's wrong there. Anyway, this is the day uh, 10 a European from early this morning. We can see it's got a nice trough here on the East Coast. And also we can see, uh, again, here's our negative up. Uh, there's the... Uh, negative Arctic Oscillation up in here. This is, notice this feature here, this is a big upper low of Greenland, so that's a positive NAO. You can't have a big upper low over Greenland, that's a positive NAO by definition. Here's a trough here on the East Coast that ridges over the Rockies, and again we have this big system here in the Gulf of Alaska. All right, if we go further out in time, this is the European Ensemble Mean showing the same sort of thing. Very nice map. Now this is the CFS as we go out into week three. Notice in week four it's very warm. Look how warm it is here. Now why is the CFS so amazingly warm? I mean, this is warm stuff. Look at this. This is I didn't ask week of October. It's really warm for the Midwest and the Plain States. The CFS uses the only last four runs, which means you know four runs each day, each cycle. So that's only 16 ensemble runs. So if the current pattern is warm, the C the CPC CFS model is likely to run a little warm. The Tropical Tidbits uses the last 12 runs, or 48 ensemble members, and it's much more likely to show less of a big swing. 
So that's one advantage of the Tropical Tidbits. And in fact, here is the CFS upper air level map from Tropical Tidbits. And again, we can see, uh, notice the uh, positive anomaly here. And the time frame, again, uh, is going into the first um, several days of November. So again, uh, pretty nice looking map there. Seasonal temperatures not nearly as warm as what the CFS has it on the CPC site. And if we look at our sea surface temperature maps, uh, well, there you go. Look at our warm temperatures here in the Gulf of Alaska. Over the, next, over the last 14 days, that has weakened somewhat because of the storms moving uh, right through the Gulf of Alaska. These big storms are coming through like this, and they're pulling and causing upwelling, and that's weakening the warm water a little bit. Now, once the pattern shifts and changes, that'll probably the upwelling will come to an end, and the warm water temperatures will come back. But it is going to continue for a while. Now, let's take a look at some new data here on the winter. This is from the Midwest of Al Marinaro or Al Joseph. You can find him on Facebook page as well. And he has some very interesting stuff. He's a research meteorologist and now is working at one of the Midwest Regional Climate Center. And uh, he's come up with some new data, which is used from time to time. This is his forecast for the North Atlantic Oscillation. He uses the May and September. I believe it's the winds in the northern Pacific. Uh, this is a formula he's come up with. It has very strong correlations, very accurate. And he's forecasting an NEO to run basically uh, slightly on the negative side. You can see uh, minus, I'll call the forecast up right here. You can see it, minus 0 0.13. Not a strong negative NEO, but generally a negative NEO for most of the winter a little below neutral and as you can see as you look at the site I won't go through it now but again most of this data usually gets the sign the phase right and the intensity fairly close so uh, he's been pretty good I have to admit and I think it's good work and I like to talk about it now his other one is he also uses the northern Pacific uh, sea level pressures when you have an El Nino he finds out there's a connection between that um, in the month of October and the NAO as well now, this only works if you have an El Nino. We, right now, we may have an El Nino. He doesn't know if we are, so he's going to hold off until we get a, a positive indication that the El Nino is developing in October. Now, if you look at the El Nino data, you see it is developing quite nicely. The warm water is coming up, so I do think we are headed for a week to moderate El Nino. Let's look at the northern hemisphere snow temperatures, snow coverage, the third highest of all time. As you can see, this got some media attention here, and I posted about it on my Facebook page. If we look at the actual snow cover itself, we can see that um, uh, that black line is 60 degrees, lot, uh, the 60 degrees north latitude. And we can see this is the current snow cover as of, September, as of October uh, 11th. Uh, and we can see a pretty good snow in Spursus Siberia, but large gaps in as well. This is eight days later. Wow. Let's go back there. Wow. <laughs> That's a pretty expansive coverage of the snow cover. And as we're as if you can tell that, um, if we look at the upper air maps here, uh, we can see that there's a big system here um, coming in at 48 hours, which is going to develop some uh, significant precipitation in Siberia. Another big trough coming in there, as you can see. Let me clear this. And then as uh, next uh, week or so, we can see several big systems. This is a nice trough, which is going to develop uh, significant snow down in northern China as well. And look at this monster coming in across some central Russia. That's going to be a big system. And then this is uh, day seven. Look at that monster in central Russia dropping a bunch of snow. And then even beyond that. Now, briefly, we can take a look at the SAI. Now, the SAI is only counts in October. That stands for the Snow Advance Index from the week 39 to 44. It is the rate of expansion of the snow southward from 60 degrees north latitude towards 25 north latitude during these three weeks. That's the thing that we're looking for here. Now, briefly in 2009, this is what happened in week 40. You can notice that the snow cover going into the end of, end of September, beginning of October, is over your age was 2.15 million. And if you look, Further on, look what happens in week 41. Huge explosion of snow cover in one week, up almost 7 million. And then again, another, then it leveled off at week 42, and then another surge of explosion of snow cover in week 43. Another 5, almost 6 million square miles were covered in snow. And then finally, in uh, 2009, uh, we had uh, another big explosion of snow cover. So this is an example of the 2009 season. Now we're going to be watching this. Are there other examples you can use? Look at 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, and we'll see what it is running for September and October. Now we start off fairly as high with snow cover in September going into October, about 5 million square miles. But over the next two, three weeks, we're going to have to see how fast that expands and how fast it continues to grow. And that's what's going to be the important issue over the next four or five weeks, and we'll be tracking it. This is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com. 
I'll talk to you soon.